Hi everyone and welcome to Back Chat. Welcome to Yoga Berry, those of you who are new here. Um, my name is Christine Jaregi Berry. I'm a yoga teacher. I specialize in um, teaching yoga for scoliosis. And if you've seen my, um, my YouTube channel before, you would see there's plenty, loads and loads of practice videos on there. I think I've um, now probably got like 120 videos on there. So plenty of things to, to get your inspiration from. But this is my weekly um, live stream and we are live on YouTube right now if you are listening to this on your podcast app. If you want to ever join us live, then you need to head over to YouTube at 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and today I've got a, a guest here with me and I'm really, really, really excited. And I know lots of you have been looking forward to this interview as well. And we're going to be talking about um, the neuroscience of uh, somatic, somatic yoga as well. And I know some of you have got some experience with this. So if you are watching this live, feel free to um, let us know if you've got any questions. So his name is James Knight and he is a yoga teacher and he's a certified HANA somatics educator. He's the integrative therapist. I'm having to look at my notes here for this, but he's going to tell us all about it. So let me bring on James. There he is. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Christine. It's nice to be here. <laughs> Lovely. And I can see, um, so I can see the chat. I know James cannot see the, the chat um, because this is a, a streaming app. Um, but Jennifer is here. She's saying hello. I will sometimes bring on the comments as well. So you will be able to see them. Now, Christina is here. She's saying hello. Hope you're all well. Now, I know that she has been very much looking forward um, to this chat today. Um, so just to put it a little bit into, into context, maybe, and uh, James, you might know this or you might not know this, but I actually came across you. Um, it, it must have been a couple of years ago now. <laughs> That's how long I've been stalking you. Um, and it was a Yoga You online course that you did. Um, and I did not have any kind of experience with uh, somatics. I know that my teacher comes from body mind centering and it was always something that she would sometimes mention, but I wasn't quite sure what exactly it was. And then um, I did your Yoga You online course and there are still, there are so many exercises in there that I still use in my own classes nowadays because they're just so they're just so amazing and and um, you know we can we can go into this obviously a little bit more into into detail as well but would you be able to kind of in your own words kind of tell us what is this what is somatics exactly okay deep breath are you ready to do this dive <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting because the word somatics, um, when I learned uh, from this tradition, Hannah somatic education, first of all, the term somatics was coined by Thomas Hannah. Mm -hmm. and he's no longer living today, um, but he left a legacy for us. Um, he was one of the really most impactful teachers in somatic movement education. And so um, he took the word um, soma, which is the Greek word for body, <clears throat> and added the ICS, which um, means experiencing the body from the inside out. So first person experience. Um, so that's the short. I'm going to keep these answers short and I'm going to invite some space for you to ask more questions because I could go in any number of directions. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But um, so what I'm, what I'm specifically interested in, because um, while well, I showed you before, I've got this book. Um, and I'm wondering, so you're, you're a yoga teacher, obviously, so I'm kind of guessing that you had a different type of training before you got into this field. Is that right? Oh, okay, so you'd like a little history? I would like a little bit of history and how you kind of brought this together. Okay, all right. <laughs> Where the connection is. Okay, good. Okay, well, um, first of all, um, I was never intending to be a body educator or a healer therapist. Um, I was always an athlete. And uh, when I was going to school at Sonoma State University, that's where I met Eleanor Criswell Hanna. That was 
uh, Thomas Hanna's wife. She was a psychology teacher at Sonoma State where I went to school. Um, I just took her class, Psychology of Yoga, in the early 1990s. And that was my very first yoga class, never had any experience with it. And I loved it so much that I started taking it um, every semester. And so it was just something I was really drawn to. Um, during that time, Eleanor, uh, Chris, Will, Hannah uh, befriend, bef befriended me and, and just started getting to know me. And she, she was really one of my very first mentors. And there was just something about that teacher and student relationship where I think she really saw something in me that I didn't know in myself yet. And she just said one day, you know, have you ever considered you know, training at the Novato Institute for Somatic Studies and Research, um, because Thomas Hanna had just died, it might have been even close to the year that I met Eleanor Criswell. Um, and he, actually I need to back up just a little teeny bit because Thomas Hanna only trained one, um, tr one training group when he was alive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people there were, I did meet some of his original students. In fact, um, those students, Eleanor, Criswell hand selected when he passed away to start the Novato um, Institute for Somatic Studies and Training. So um, yeah, so, so Thomas Hanna had this, this training group, gave all of his information, everything that he knew um, away before he actually passed before they graduated. So Eleanor Criswell Hanna um, sought out the world experts to kind of fill in the last missing um, gaps of the training. And so they graduated and then she hand selected um, his students to be facilitators for the training that I took. So that's how far back it goes. Like this is almost 30 years ago. So it was really this incredible moment in time where I feel like I was past the baton. I'm getting chills right now thinking about it, that she said, you know, James, you might consider doing the training here. And I'm like, okay. And she says, have you considered taking a massage training course? Cause she wanted me to understand physiology anatomy and how to touch people and so i just said yes and that's what started my entire path so this was before yoga mm -hmm. um, i studied my clinical training it was a three-year certification very intense and it was during that time while i was training at the institute that eleanor was um, elected as the psychology chair and so she asked me if i would teach her somatic yoga class at sonoma state and again i had no other yoga experience so I was like, you know, I, if she asked me, then I was like, okay, well then I will do the best I can. And this was actually before even I had my master's degree. So there I was teaching this upper division psychology class called Somatic Yoga. At mm -hmm. State. We had 50 students in a large gym and it was so experiential and so beautiful. There was the science portion where we had discussions and reading, and then there was the experiential portion and I loved it. And so that's really, when I started gaining more experience, eventually I did take traditional yoga training, but not till a couple years later, I really just trained as a clinician, a clinical Hannah somatic educator. And um, we can talk about that more later, um, how I developed my method from that. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, yeah, I was not even a, a yoga, I don't even know if Yoga Alliance was an organization when I started teaching yoga. Mm interesting very good thank you for that so i'm just acknowledging a couple of my, more people here Alison is saying hello um good um so what i was wondering as well so i'm probably gonna jump a little bit because go ahead. I've got I, I love so many. spiral conversation so it works for me <laughs> i've got lots of lots of questions okay um but there is this so uh, what what I really enjoyed about this, and I, I actually felt like when I when I did, I, I know that you're obviously a, um, you brought the two together, but even when I only did the uh, the classes that I did with people who are not yoga teacher, but teaching this kind of uh, somatics and teaching this method, I found that it was very close to yoga. So it was very, um, it was not foreign to me at all. It was like something that just kind of fits in very, very, very well together. Um, but what I found, there's one particular exercise that really stand stood out for me. There's, there's actually, there's two actually. <laughs> and one of them was where we're just imagining the movement. Oh yes. 
So we were doing this and there was a standing pose and it was about we were doing different movements and then so you do your movement and afterwards you feel how it feels and obviously one side feels a lot better because it's been moved and there have been some twists and some rotations and all of that. And then on the other side, James asked us to not actually do the movement but just to imagine it in your in your head, basically imagining the movement. And I was like, well, that's, you know, that's rubbish. That's not going to work, is it? That's not actually, <laughs> but it did actually work. Um, so can you, is it magic? What's happening there? Can you tell us a little bit about this? Oh my gosh, that's funny that you would use that word because that's what I call the somatic movement flow. So the somatic movement flow is something that I coined to describe the sequences, the therapeutic and corrective sequences within general somatic yoga. So we are jumping ahead now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I call that somatic movement flow miracle moment. And I call it miracle moment because it is, it feels like, you know, how can that be? How can I increase my range of motion significantly? Most people can experience a significant change in range of motion by just visualizing the movement. Um, and Boy, um, okay, so we're gonna go backwards and forwards a lot in this interview, I can tell, because what I need to actually back up now because I will answer your question, but um, I wanna go back to the history of how this started because when I was learning somatics from the Hannah somatic tradition, the word somatics was a buzzword. Like a lot, most people didn't even hear this word. So it's blowing my mind now, 30 years later, that it's so popular. People understand it. People can get their, their master's degree, their PhD in somatics. Um, you have to understand where I came from. Even yoga wasn't popular. And I lived in Southern California where Paramahansa Yogananda has his ashram. So mm -hmm. I was in the thick of, if there was anywhere in the world where there was yoga in the West, it was where I was living. So um, while I was getting trained, um, at once I got, once I had the experience of embodiment of the, 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 of this method, like the, the profound therapeutic effects, I started training with a lot of different teachers during that time, not only just clinical Hanasomatic education, but I studied with Barbara Brennan. Um, so I was wanting to understand about energy work, with the auras and the chakras. I still to this day have at least one or two very strong spiritual teachers that I train with energy and consciousness and quantum physics. I became a Watsu practitioner, which is aquatic therapy. I got trained in multiple, um, I haven't even counted how many massage therapy, um, you know, different kind of techniques. Um, and then I also became a core energetic psychotherapist, which was another four year extensive training, body oriented um, psychotherapy. So throughout the years, for 30 years, I've been incorporating other techniques into general somatic yoga. Now the neuroscience, I want to be very clear, is Hannah somatic education. It's very scientific. It's very reliable. It's easy. It's simple. Um, I think for most people it's accessible. So I want to be clear about that. I'm going to be talking about the miracle moment again in a second. But um, I, because I'm so uh, passionate about wanting to understand the truth about everything. <laughs> um, I'm a Scorpio. It's interesting. There was a Scorpio full moon last night and I was really ener I'm energized by that energy right now is I want I'm passionate. I want to know everything about everything about everything. <laughs> so I wanted to not just understand what the body was doing. I want to understand the emotions, the mind, the spirituality. I'm interested in addressing the whole self. So eventually we'll get to that, like how general somatic yoga was born. But so I wanted to mention that because with uh, the, the somatic, uh, excuse me, miracle moment, the one that you're talking about, I believe one side when you're doing it physically. So, so basically I'll tell the audience, but uh, you're standing up, you're on two feet, you're committing to your stance and you're uh, lifting one arm, the active side, and you're twisting to, let's say you're twisting to the right. So you're twisting to the right to your fullest range of motion without pain or strain. Your arm is up, your fingers are past, your, your arm is extended and you're looking pat, your eyes are looking past your fingertips and you're putting an imaginary dot somewhere on the furniture, the wall. And in general somatic yoga, we like to, um, whenever we can, we'd like to have pre-checks and post-checks. So pre-check before you do the movement, post-check after you do the movement, because the brain learns through contrast. So this is the physical side, is the right side, I'm giving an example. So then you bring your arm back, 
you bring your arm back down by your side. And so the, the right side done physically, you're practicing pendiculation. And pendiculation is one of the main techniques in general somatic yoga. It comes from somatic education. It's where you uh, mindfully choose an anatomical focus to engage, contract that specific muscle groups, mm -hmm. the lost the better. And then you witness it from the inside out uh, after you contract, then you slowly, slowly, slowly release that contraction and eventually release all muscular effort. That's the hallmark of general somatic yoga is a pendiculation, which is very different. It's the opposite of stretching. We don't mm -hmm. focus on stretching in general somatic yoga. So that's, so I'm explaining one, the active side. Now the other side, it's more about um, quantum physics because wherever you place your attention, that's where something's going to be. And I also have studied extensively in shamanism as well and a lot of meditation. So with this, with the, with the left side, you check the pre-check. Oh, sorry. Then you do the post-check. You do the pendiculations of the active side. Then you do the post-check. Most people experience 15 to 20% increase a range of motion without stretching. And then you're finished with that side. You go to the left side and you do the pre-check. So you physically lift your arm, you extend, you twist to the left, extend and look past your left fingertips, place a dot on them imaginary dot, come back to neutral. And then as Christine was saying, the rest of the flow is done in your imagination with your eyes closed. So, um, oh, okay, one more thing to throw into the mix. I've also done some extensive brainwave research when I was getting my master's degree. So I really mapped out in my own self what beta brainwave feels like, what alpha brainwave feels like, what theta, delta. So I combined, I used a lot of those, a lot of my consciousness uh, training uh, experiences and put them into this specific movement, just visualizing the movement, which I have found connects and strengthens the neural pathways just mm -hmm. as strongly as pendiculation. <laughs> and so for me, when I teach it, that's part of my inspiration. It's not about magic. It's about showing the power of consciousness and the power of directing our consciousness because in quantum physics, energy follows consciousness. And for people that don't have access to their physical body, let's say they've been paralyzed or they've had a stroke or they've they're bedridden or you know they, they've been in an accident i like showing this miracle moment because you can still affect and reprogram your brain to muscle connection through visualizing mm -hmm. so you know i don't like to focus so much on the magic part of it in fact i don't use it all that often but it sure is inspiring um, for people who have limit limitations in their body temporarily they can use this technique and it's equally as profound as the pendiculation mm. Yes, absolutely. And um, yeah, so I mean, more recently, I've been doing a little bit more kind of, um, I don't know if you know the guys from Z Health, but they do kind of neurology, uh, brain based training, and some of it, it's different, but it sometimes reminds me of, of this, because there is a lot of things with voluntary movements on the right side of the body are governed by the left side of the brain. And then sometimes you use your eyes to kind of access this. So I thought maybe it's got something to do with that. Maybe you're kind of, if you're imagining, maybe you're using your eyes to 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 do this. Um, but yes, of course, the the, the whole, the, um, the, the, the focusing and then the kind of the neural pathways that you that you mentioned that makes that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, well, and you know, you've, you've heard before, probably most of you that gymnasts you know olympic gymnasts and olympic divers they they practice the whole routine in their head before they actually do it mm. and yes. so you know that's just a fact that's just part of their and and so i do that as well i just worked with somebody yesterday on zoom i do um, clinical sessions from time to time i've retired from my practice for the most part doing clinical sessions but um you know now that i teach online um, training courses some people will want individual sessions so anyway i was working with somebody who had extreme chronic pain for years and years and years you name it she has it um and so uncomfortable with twisting and so i just wanted to experiment with her if you just visualize it's just a really gentle way to work with some people because the body wants to feel safe when it's changing it wants to feel like it's not in danger specifically to stay in the parasympathetic nervous system so that the brain can learn 
you know? And so um, there was profound results. In fact, I'm feeling emotional right now talking about it to see like, there's just so much potential for healing, you know? And, and a, a lot of this is science-based, but I also feel for me, it's heart-based because it's compassion, it's empathy, it's learning to develop a, a more kind, loving relationship with self. And this is one way. Th this miracle moment, you know, this this reprogramming, this through visualizing, you know, because it's it's really coming inside and trusting your soma, you know, trusting your body, and it's almost like you're commanding your 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 um, intelligence. I call it your somatic intelligence. You're acknowledging that there's this great mystery within us, every person. There's this there's this mystery, this life force, this life impulse that not only wants to survive, it wants to thrive. All living somas desire to thrive and so there's something really beautiful for me to connect in humanity with this knowing that all somas want to thrive and I, I tap into that when i'm working with people and um and that and that gives me me and, and i think also people a lot of hope as well mm. yes i love that yeah beautiful um i'm just going through some of these comments here as they, as they are coming in so liz is saying that she's been looking forward to this. Um, hi, Liz. And hi, then Liz. we've got Hege is saying she is a Watsu practitioner. She's saying it's uh, great for scoliosis. Yes, yes. And then Jenna is saying I'm still trying to get my head around HANA somatics. Would you say it's at all similar to cranial osteopathic treatment or quite different in terms of how it works in your brain? That's a great question. <laughs> Would you like me to answer? Yes, please. <laughs> it's not for you. It's not for you. Okay. <laughs> keep going through them. <laughs> um, now let's stick with this one first. And we've got Candice uh, sending us good health. So <laughs> thank you, Candice. And the same to you, of course. Um, but let's go back to Jenna's question here. OK, it's, it's interesting. I just wanted to share kind of as a disclaimer, people will ask me about different methods. Like I get a lot of questions about yin yoga, in this case, cranial osteopathic treatment. I don't know what that is. I'm not trained in it. So it's difficult mm -hmm. for me to answer the question knowledgeably because I'm not familiar with this method. I can only speak about Hannah somatic education, but I, I can intuitively kind of sense an answer. Um, I do. I, I don't know if cranial osteopathic treatment is similar to cranial sacral therapy because I've certainly received a lot of cranial. Yeah, therapy. and I wonder if that's a UK thing. I don't know, Jenna, whereabouts you are because I have had some treatments, um, cranial osteopathic treatments, but I know that osteopaths are very different in the US than they are in the UK. Okay. Um, well, I can share um, my. I think I, I can answer this question without knowing what it is. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Because even to this date, I have not experienced anyone doing quite what Hannah Semitic education does. I mean, I've taken Feldenkrais, of course, and the roots of of general somatic yoga and Thomas, um, excuse me, Hannah Semitic education's Feldenkrais, huge contribution, like major contribution. So um, the hallmark of of Hannah Semitic education is this this art of pendiculation so you're engaging both the sensory cortex and the motor cortex part of the brain this is the part of the brain where you where if we can activate it then we regain voluntary control of our physiology if 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 anybody if, if you're well except for those of you that are driving <laughs> if you can place your fingers on top of your shoulder most adults are going to find some knots right like definitely be surprised Huh? Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can for sure. I sit at my computer quite a bit. And so that's a sign of sensory motor and amnesia. Those muscles on top of my shoulder that I'm feeling that are tight, those muscles are contracting and they're staying contracted as if they were on autopilot. So even though how much my mind, even though we just talked about the miracle moment, I can ask those muscles from my consciousness, muscles relax stop contracting <laughs> and the muscles are still going to be like man you know they're going to be hard they're going to be like so i can go get massage i can go get a chiropractic adjustment i could try some acupuncture all of those treatments are very effective for different reasons but they're not going to change the muscle memory so enhanced somatic education uh, oh and also 
because the muscles are engaged on autopilot, the sensory motor cortex is not involved. So in HANA somatic education, we, we want to activate the sensory cortex by sensing and feeling something. And then we want to use the motor cortex, which is to act on that sensing. So it's very much uh, an engagement. It is not passive at all. There are passive techniques, but I'm not going to talk about them right now. The main technique is, is to engage and sense a specific muscle group. So, you, so the client or the student has to do something. They have to, they have to bring their muscles in towards the midline. They have to engage the muscle groups. That's very important. Then there, there has to be mindfulness with that. And then there's a mindfulness of disengaging. Now that's the motor cortex choosing to softly and slowly release a muscle group until the fullest range of motion. And then the full release as best you can. And then, so that whole process stimulates the sensory motor cortex. So I'm guessing, I don't know what the cranial osteopathic treatment is, but I've never seen any other method that engages that much interaction. It's not passive at all. Mm. It has to have all those parts. The pendiculation has to have the choice of the focus of the muscle. It has to, you know, the slow release and the complete letting go to be a tradition, you know, to be a, a to be a pendiculation. So I've not seen any other method do that in the 30 years I've been practicing. Yeah, and that is, that is, um, I feel this has such a more kind of lasting effect on, on somebody as well, isn't it? When they are actively involved in this, there's so much more learning going on when you're, when you're actually actively doing something rather than having something done to you. Um, and this is this is my experience from the uh, cranial osteopathic treatments. Um, very very different. I mean, this is not a movement at all. You're basically just lying there, and then somebody puts a hand uh, their hands on your head, and they actually tell you to switch off. So please do not be involved at all. <laughs> like you know, go into your into yeah. your relaxed space, and you know, don't get involved. So it, it it's it's very different. But I'm sure it works together yeah. quite well, well. It, it can yeah and like i said i'm not here to talk about any other methods i in my healing path i have lots of spiritual teachers and healers and, and there's different i go to i go to them for different reasons um but to be really clear i liked how you you brought it up like in, in general somatic yoga we are reprogramming the brain to muscle connection the ultimate aim that uh, the intention is to reprogram the length of a muscle group to its more its most optimal length in a resting position. So if I was laying down, lying down right now, then my muscles are going to be in their longest length. In other words, they're not contracting on autopilot. You know, they, they're more soft, they're supple, and there's more energy accessible through that muscle when I want to use it. So in that way, then I think strength returns when a muscle group is reprogrammed to their longest length. Um, and efficiency, there's just a lot more choice points in the body. And that's what Thomas Hanna was really interested in when he developed this method. He was a, a scholar and an author and a lecturer, a philosopher. And his topic that he was interested in was freedom. And so for me, that's if I had to choose one word, I would say that was that's my value is freedom. Don't we all want to be free? in this lifetime and freedom for me is having choice points coming away from reaction and defense into choice points that allow me to experience pleasure and what i call the inner yes in life something that is generative something that fuels my life force that to me would be like a yes and we have our full yes when we have more choices so if i want to you know, lift something from the ground and put it in my car, I have that possibility. If I want, I just went skiing the other day and I haven't for a really long time. I want that choice of that control of, you know, one one ski to the next ski and my arms and my legs and my breath. And, you know, there's more pleasure in life when your body's free to move and make all these oh, yes. choices. So um, in, in gentle somatic yoga, the pendiculation, uh, brings back that voluntary control. And I feel like that's really empowering because it is long lasting, especially when you're unwinding from something challenging, uh, a trauma. We all have experienced traumas. All the traumas are stored in our body. Uh, so all of us carry these reflexes to stress in our soma. 
And so when you reprogram a muscle to a different length, to a longer length, you do need to practice the movements for a while, regularly up to 20 to 40 days for that to become your new default, because you will experience, most people experience profound results in the very first somatic movement flow they've done. You can gain 10 to 20% increase in range of motion, but if you're not, because you are training your brain and you are, which is the nervous system, and you are training the muscles, um, until your brain recognizes that that's the new default, it will go back to its, the muscles will go back to their, the shape they were before you did the movement. But over time, the effects are cumulative. And then, and I, I am a living testimony to the work because I'm pretty free and pretty balanced and 55. And whenever I experience pain or discomfort in my body, I do a pendiculation, I come back to neutral again. Mm. And I've seen that with my clients and my students. And I, I feel like that's why this method is, become, is gaining a worldwide recognition because I've taken the science of hanasomatic education, merged it with yoga, taking in different disciplines and create group movement classes so that more people can experience this at one time. And of course, that's, that's why I'm here. This, that's my passion. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question about because you mentioned it already a little bit, the stretching that we actually we you you don't actually stretch, you do kind of the opposite. Um so with so let's really bring it in to scoliosis obviously and, and you know sure. my community, everyone sure. here usually has yeah. scoliosis and, and what I hear as uh, as a teacher, what I hear over and over again and what I feel in my body as well and with my scoliosis, we have this one side, the convexity usually, which is, um, this is where everything is really tight, but it's overstretched tight. And you feel like you want to stretch it. But then if you kind of think about, well, actually, if I stretch it, then I'm just kind of going further into my curvature. So I don't really want to do that. And then we've got the other side, which is like, not there, basically, there's no sensation that's it's, 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 it's really kind of sleepy. So um, I'm wondering how you would kind of, how you would approach this. So let's talk about this kind of overstretched long side, maybe. How would you kind of, um, again, I'm kind of thinking you're not gonna stretch it more, but what, what would be kind of your approach or what would be your thinking about this? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to opening this up because I haven't spoke with, I, I have worked with scoliosis quite a bit um, throughout my career, um, but I haven't really spoken with my peers about it. So Christine, this is, this is going to be fun for me because I'd really like to interact with you with this conversation. Because um, intuitively I know when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people, so to bring it into, into words will be a, a fun challenge for me. So yeah, let's talk about stretching first of all. So, and, and, you, and those of you that are listening or watching, you know that I'm a yoga teacher. Um, so I've been trained in multiple methods. I know about stretching <laughs> and there's, you know, I really believe in the science of yoga and the lifestyle of yoga. You know, Paramahansa Yogananda is one of my inspirational teachers reading the, uh, the autobiography of a yogi. So I just want to make it clear that I really um, appreciate and I feel like this is my lifestyle, the yoga lifestyle. But it's not just about stretching. <laughs> so stretching um, for me is moving away from the midline of the body. So the midline being the center of the body. I also call the center the somatic center fondly. Um, you know, it's interesting because I don't know whether it was into instinctual or training, but I remember when I used to get hurt before I really understood the neuroscience of somatics, I think that I would want to move away, like stretch a muscle that hurts. Like I would want to, I remember as an athlete, yeah, if I, if I had sciatic or, uh, you know, pain in my leg, I'd be like, oh man, I have to stretch that. So I'm moving away from the midline. I'm extending my limbs and, um, now, 30 years later, I realized the body doesn't really like it. When the body's in pain, the body does not like to stretch. If, if, it's, to, if it's to correct an injury, it's the opposite. So in general somatic yoga, we do get into positions, body shapes, where, the, where you're, the, you're going to experience that length of a muscle group. But the thing is, we just don't hold it 
as a guideline longer than three seconds. So I want to make that clear. In general semantic yoga, you, you will find yourself in these stretching positions, but not for long because mm -hmm. I don't want the, the soma to experience a stretch reflex, which we can talk about in a little bit, which is, well, I'll talk about it now. <laughs> it's so that where the body feels like it's in danger and the muscles recoil as a reflex. Like if, if you're in pain, you're stretching and you think, oh, no pain, no gain, and, you, and you're just going to keep going for it. You know, you're going to get that shoulder up there, lifted to the ceiling if it's frozen. And, and the body says, no, 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 no. And the body can recoil back tighter than it was before you did the stretch. So, um, so that's that. So what we do in general somatic yoga, as I've mentioned, is you actually do the opposite. You actually shorten the muscle group not into pain or strain, but just so that the sensory motor cortex can engage and you can identify where is that? What, what part of my anatomy is being challenged right now? So with the attitude of exploration and discovery, you actually hug your muscles in towards the discomfort. So with scoliosis, one side is blank and the tissues aren't as alive and there's not a, a lot of sensation that appears there's not a lot of strength and then one side is super heightened sensation super tight muscles hard to touch um and so here's my thought on this the side that is hard this is the the con convex side right mm -hmm. the convex side yes the muscles are working overtime and they're the the insertion in the origin, I know this is a big topic in yoga right now, but they're, the belly of the muscles coming closer together and the muscles are staying contracted on autopilot. In our work, we call that sensory motor amnesia. It means that the forward part of the brain where you have voluntary control, sensory motor cortex, has temporarily turned off. And so those muscles are contracting, contracting, contracting all the time. And that can be really exhausting. I mean, I know people that are living with chronic pain, it's the whole, the whole soma system is energetically drained because those muscles are constantly firing. So, so the muscles are on autopilot, um, they're fatigued, muscles surrounding them, they get recruited, they get fatigued, and the whole alignment continually gets thrown off all the time, and especially with the flow of gravity coming through the body when you're standing or sitting that creates even more challenges. So one side is overly contracted. The other side, the conking side, is the tissues are underactive. And so what, what, what I would do, what I do in general somatic yoga is definitely working both sides, but one side you wanna gently go, I'm gonna use this word kiss, like kiss the edges. How can you, how can you figure out the function of those muscle groups? Now the back has a lot of different muscle groups. So in general somatic yoga, we like to focus on the smaller parts and pieces first, and then we work to larger ones. So mm -hmm. let's say that the rhomboid muscles are engaged or the paravertebral muscles are engaged or the rhomboid muscles. So in general somatic yoga, we do specific movements to activate the smallest muscle groups. We engage them consciously. That's the pendiculation. We're sensing the muscles engaging, which you know what, if they're fatigued, a person may not actually feel the muscles all the time. It might feel numb actually. So it might take a while to bring sensation back for other people. Oh, they know it. They're in pain. <laughs> it's <laughs> angry right there. <laughs> but um, so anyways, we would, we would create a movement that actually engages muscular effort and then come closer into activating the belly of the muscle, slowly come away and into a fuller range of motion. And then, as I mentioned, pause and rest. So we would do that several times. And what that does is it's the muscles start releasing their, the tension. The muscle fibers start lengthening. You're reprogramming the muscles to a longer length in a resting position. So we would definitely work with the side that's contracted for sure, because they need to be woke, awaken. Is that the right tense of the word? Awa awoken? No. Awaken? <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but you know what I mean? It needs to be enlivened. It needs to be like, hey, you guys, come on. Like, yeah. Like, loosen up. <laughs> but it's not through stretching. And then the other side is saying, hey, what about me? Like, there's hardly any movement over here. So a person might experience 
a feeling of lack of strength, but it's just because the muscles haven't been used. So I would, mm -hmm. as a somatic educator, I would want to do movements that actually activated the tissue, just the same as the opposite side, have their brain remember, oh yeah, there are muscles here. You may not be able to feel them right now because they're not working very much, but I would want the brain, the sensory motor cortex to actually discover what those muscle groups are and witnessing them turning on and off as well, because we want those muscles to work, to pull the, the spine back into alignment. We want one, of the, one side of the muscles to activate and get strengthened and the other side to release the muscle contraction. Mm. So. Um, Brilliant, great explanation. Sorry, I did put you on the spot. <laughs> I do realize that, but uh, you've, you've explained it um, okay. so well. And you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it, it will make so much sense for a lot of people who are who are listening to it and who can yeah. feel this in in their in their bodies as well so i do have quite a few questions coming in are you okay yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, i'm energized now i'm i'm all like woo -woo. yes yes <laughs> it is early in the morning for you of course <laughs> um so we've got jennifer she's saying james um what you do is exactly what i want to do as a graduate student in neuroscience how do i even start this career path because sometimes i get overwhelmed by the amount of information that's yeah. jennifer yeah gosh how beautiful how exciting i'm so excited we're living in a time when we have so much information available to us but you're right it can be really overwhelming i mean gosh i was fortunate to have met eleanor criswell hannah at the time that i did who would have ever known now 30 years later i'm doing i've created this own my own method of yoga which is isn't really mine because it's so many different parts and pieces from brilliant people um i would suggest maybe contacting the Nevada institute for somatic studies and research. I don't know what's happening. I've lost contact with them with um, COVID. I don't know how much they're doing online. Um, I know that they do meet once a year um, in person, which is north of San Francisco. That's where I live. Now there's also another, there's another school on the East Coast of the United States. I'm not familiar with that institute that trains. And I know that there are a couple of other uh, students. So, some students of Thomas Hanna, the original ones, let's say the original group, some of those students have gone to create their own institutes. I only know of the Nevada Institutes of Somatic Studies and Research on the west coast of California. That's where I learned from Eleanor Criswell and the team of original um, students from Thomas Hanna. But there are a couple of other students of Thomas Hanna who have created institutes. I don't know uh, about them personally, but those I know there's other options. I know that Martha Peterson is doing something on her own. Um, so I would suggest training, um, finding and interviewing those schools. I'm biased to the one in California because um, I feel like they're, I've, I've, I've been training with them. I go to their conventions, I teach for them and they are the real deal, high integrity. Is, is learning the neuroscience through this tradition, Thomas Hanna education. Um, so that's what I'd recommend um is learning learning the neuroscience and then you know if you're interested in doing group classes then i think that's my specialty that's where i you know i was one of the early pioneers to bridge somatics and yoga obviously eleanor crisel hannah she's the founder of somatic yoga but then i've i've created and i brought in more things to make it work for groups so it depends on your intention of what you want to do with your education, if you want to do just clinical or research, then train with Hannah Somatic Education. Because it is, it's just so different than any other thing I've, I've learned. Um, and I think um, biofeedback too. Um, I think this is a study that's underused. I think understanding how the brain works and having an embodied experience, how the brain works. I haven't talked about this for a long time, but I can see now how important that influenced me of understanding how to control my own physiology. Yeah. Anything that you can learn to control your own physiology. That would be another another uh, tip mm. of support. Brilliant, thank you. Christina is saying, I have recently done a workshop on somatic movement for scoliosis. It was very helpful in sensing the spirals that come with um, asymmetries. And then she's saying, and how the somatic practice kind of frees the body 
and you've talked about freedom obviously as well a little bit um of the of that vice that the muscles are in of course i need to practice loads let me let me read that one from christina because i was just thinking about the last question oops <laughs> You flipped. It's not really a question. It was more of a comment oh, that she's saying she's okay. done an um, oh. she's done a, a workshop. She found it very useful for her scoliosis um, and freeing the body of of the you know of that that kind of uh, that constant contraction, I guess, that we were talking about yeah. before and uh, the the yeah. the uh, the chronic pain. I'm just looking through here. So Laura is also saying that sounds interesting. Let's try when we are in pain. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Can I can I talk a little bit more about sensory motor amnesia? It kind of fits to some of these questions. Sure. Is that Please okay? Do. Yes. So sensory motor amnesia. I want to expand this this topic a little bit because when we were talking about um, the concave and the convex side, it's interesting because sensory motor amnesia is on both sides. So sensory motor amnesia is when the when the uh, the sensory motor cortex has temporarily forgotten voluntary control, and so that's what we're looking for as a clinician and as as a, a movement educator. When I'm with my yoga students, as I I want to help people identify where sensory motor amnesia is in their body, because that's the part we want to wake back up again. We want to almost say like, "Hello, <laughs> come back, come back." Mm -hmm. Um, sensory motor amnesia can be identified as pain. That's the most obvious one. Anywhere where there's muscular pain, it can be reprogrammed with general somatic yoga. Um, but also numbness is the same exact thing. When we can't feel a particular part of our body, that can be sensory motor amnesia. Clicking, popping, I call it ratcheting. When you're, if, if you lift your shoulder to your ear and you brought it back down again and it came down in chunks, I would call that ratcheting. So these are all signs of sensory motor amnesia where the neuropathways from the brain to the muscle, there's been skips or gaps. And that's what we're filling in through conscious movement. That's how we activate the part of the brain where we can regain control. So when you're doing these movements, when you're trying, even if you're exploring this without having done any, any, one, of my, any one of my workshops, by the way, which I do this year, I have tons of online and live streaming trainings and courses i don't know how when it when i chose this year my my schedule i was now i'm right in it and i'm like oh my gosh every weekend but there's always something going on if you want to learn from me but uh, you have to practice them you have to practice the movements and but i wanted to say something else what was it um oh that you're looking for that in your body that's part of the discovery and the, of exploration is when you're witnessing your anatomy change body shapes and you experience one of those things that i just listed then you can stop and go okay that's where i want to bring my my focus that's where i want to bring my consciousness is to that part of my body whether it's the convex side that doesn't have a lot of sensation then maybe your intention is you know what i want to do some movements so i can activate sensation or the other side, the concave side, you might be, you know what, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain behind my shoulder blade. I'm gonna create some movements, some functional anatomy, some movements to be able to engage and disengage that part of my body. Really important that you pause and release all muscular effort when you're practicing pendiculation. If you don't, it's not gonna be a re-education, it's just gonna be an exercise and that's not what we're doing. So I wanted to share that about sensory motor amnesia as, you, as we are highlighting, activating, bringing voluntary control back to our physiology, but it's through mindfulness and it's through mm -hmm. gentleness, it's through um, being kind with ourselves and listening to our body's messages. That's what we get to take off the mat if you're a yoga teacher, if you're in a yoga class, or if you're working one-on-one, -on -one, is what we want to, to listen to our body's messages when we're in stress. It, since it's reflex to trauma, we might be gritting our teeth, we might be holding our breath, we might be uh, sitting at our computer for too long and our, our lower back hurts, but we just gotta get that done. Well, if we learn to listen to our body's messages sooner to the point that we know that we're out of balance, we can self-correct and that's really empowering when when you can sense that your body's giving you a message and you know right away oh i need to move the body needs to move 
the fascia, the connective tissue, the muscles, we need to move. And so I want to just uh, inspire those of you who are watching or listening is that it is conscious movement. It's a conscious decision mm -hmm. to bring awareness into the body through movement. And, you know, that's where we can benefit in so many ways, you know, mm -hmm. we deep in our relationship with our soma. It's really intimate isn't it when we can listen to our body's messages and go okay wait a minute this activity this movement is not generative i'm hurting myself so i'm gonna stop <laughs> you know it's just a completely different mindset yes and you're, you're absolutely speaking my language here and those of you those of you i know that some of you have done my courses before and you know that, uh, <laughs> that, I, that i always harp on about this but this is how this is so it's because I always get asked, you know, what are the exercises I need to do for scoliosis? Right. right? And then it's almost, it's becoming like a checklist of things. Right. right? I'm going to do this every day. Right. Um, and, you know, these are the things. But that's not what it's about. It's, it's, it's really about you, right? It's, it's really about sensing what is happening when, when you are doing these um specific things which is is always going to be so much more powerful than kind of just working through your your list and ticking things off correct yeah of what to do yeah um, and you don't want anything to become so regular the brain is designed to learn that's also yeah you know it has somatic education so in general somatic yoga it's education it is therapeutic for sure but because of this internal interaction um you want to do new things all the time to, to keep the brain alert. And I think that that also goes along with this conversation is you don't want to do the same things every single day. I don't think there really is one particular protocol that I ever give to my students because I think we need to address the whole body, which includes the other aspects as well, not just the musculature. Yes absolutely and for us with scoliosis uh, you know we're always caught up caught up on the x-ray and you are so much more than your yeah. bones you know even you you know there's so much more to you and this again now you're saying it, that we're so much more than uh the muscles as well so that you know there's so many layers to this and oh, yeah, um, layers. yeah absolutely thank you so much um do you have any kind of any so you've already told us where we can basically you're running uh, courses and you're running uh workshops online so we're going to check that out i'm going to link to that if you've got something specific coming up let me know and i will link to it in the in the in the video in the youtube video and on the podcast um do you have any kind of book recommendations or anything where we can read up on this a little bit more you know, I feel like Martha Peterson, she's made a really nice contribution um, called, I think it's Moving with Pain. Move, no, Move, what is her book called? I can't think of it right now, but she really breaks down um, move, without, move Without Pain, it might be. Uh, eh. <laughs> Hopefully Without Pain. <laughs> yeah, no, without Pain, yeah, I was just trying to visualize that. Um, it's just that because it breaks down these concepts in a really palatable way. Thomas Hanna book, um, Christine, the one that you showed at the beginning of class, just called Somatics. So yes, that's this one. That one, yeah. I would highly recommend that one. You know, there's these kind of like stick art figures in them, which makes it kind of difficult sometimes, the illustration. We've changed so much in the way that we, that, you know, our media, you know, now we have video, we have 3D. Yes, these Yeah, are. exactly. So some people might look at that and go, well, I don't really understand that. But back to what we were just talking about, Christine, I think the reason why Thomas used those art figures is that he didn't want you to fixate on one person thinking that you have to look like that. Mm -hmm. You know, each soma is so incredibly different. Um, and so we don't want to think, oh, we should be, we should be able to do that. I think that's why, you know, so, um, but anyway, the information in the book's amazing because it talks about the three main reflexes, red light, green light, and trauma. And the trauma reflex is what uh, people with scoliosis are working with, is where one side of the body where there's a torque or a twist. So understanding that reflex could be really useful. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend those those two books. Yeah, and Christina's just confirming it's move without pain, Martha Thank Peterson. You. Thank you. I've never met Martha before. I'm looking forward to it someday, to meet her someday. 
Excellent. Great. Thank you so much for your time today, James. Is there anything else you would like to, um, any advice or anything kind of parting words from you? Yeah, sure. Well, um, you were asking before how people can find me. I, I've been um, having a lot of fun with us, what I call the somatic sanctuary. It's once a month. I don't have it memorized when the next one is. It's going to be in May. But if anybody wants to just have a, a, a one hour experience with me, please join me. It's a global audience. I have so much fun. We just had it the other day and people from all over the world join. I have a theme. So you're welcome to join me for that. Um, and I have it at times where the people in the uh, UK, you guys can take it because I think I do it at 10 a.m., which is 6 p.m. for you. Yeah, perfect. That's once, that's once a month, as well as in Asia, I have a second class. So that's just one little thing to invite you guys to come and, 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 and move with me. Um, but the, to this audience specifically, um, let me tune in just one second. I'm pretty, I noticed myself pretty hyper, pretty passionate, um, which is fun to feel, but let me slow down for a second. Yeah, okay. So um, first of all, I think what I'd like to part with is, is, is to inspire you, to invite you to create a really strong intention. Like, for example, it might, your intention might be like, I want to learn, I want to learn something new in my body. And I want to come out, I want to unwind from these um, deep holding stress patterns in my body. And working with intentions, with curiosity, then you can really be gentle with yourself and start tuning in without judgment and um, learning to accept um, whatever's going on as whatever it is, is where you're at. And so just starting with that, the, a really compassionate place or continuing, some of you may already have that practice, but, you know, letting your ask your body what wants to be discovered um, deep in your relationship through intimacy with your body what part of your body wants to be discovered what part of your body wants to be awakened and then trust yourself through movement start letting your body guide you into movement that's what i feel like the art of pendiculation is actually very natural phenomenon because if you look if you have a dog or a cat most animals all animals actually pendiculate you can see them engaging their muscles when they wake up from a nap and then they extend their limbs, you know, and we do it as humans. We were sleeping and we're getting, we're in bed and we want to kind of make fists and kind of hug our muscles and then extend and a yawn. So you see pendiculation is actually a very natural thing. It's just that in general somatic yoga, Hannah somatics, we've turned it into a technique, a mindful technique, but I'd like to leave you the audience to, Practice today, like next time you're laying on the floor or in your bed, just think about some of these concepts and just think about mindfully waking up your body by coming into engaging your muscle groups with love and compassion and then extending away from those areas. Let the body be longer and then rest between that exploration. And I have a feeling that you might experience something just now. And though that's like one stepping stone but you're using your own somatic intelligence. You're, you're tuning in and, you, and you're letting your body show you where to go next. That, that's what I'd like to, to leave you with. Oh, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And there's lots of love coming in for you here. Lots oh, of people saying, thank you. Thank, thank you, Laura, you. saying my little dog does Adamukha every morning before, <laughs> before beginning its day. <laughs> What'd you say? Her yes. dog does, uh, does a downward dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Every day. Chris, Good, thank lovely. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for um, inviting me into your podcast. And thank you for the audience that tuned in. I really feel your love. And I loved your questions. Um, and I hope we get to do this again sometime, Christine. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you later.